Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another night here. Uh, it's day four of the lockdown here in Ontario, uh, episode number four. Uh, and I'm very uh, excited for today's episode. Uh, I have someone joining me who uh, I had the pleasure of going to high school with. Uh, she's been working her way towards, uh, I believe, a really cool goal. And uh, we're going to talk all about that today. Uh, she's been um, boxing all over the world for uh, the past uh, since she was 18. So we're, we're going to talk all about that story and uh, I'm excited uh, to talk about it today. And uh, joining me now is Caitlin Clark. Caitlin, how's it going? It's been a long time. Yeah, Aaron, no kidding. Um, it's going well. How are you? Not too bad. And I, I believe we, were you on the wrestling team in high school? I can't remember. No, we threw disc together. Disc. Okay. I, I think it was shot put. Yeah. Yeah, shot I don't, put. I don't of, think I could. Those, I don't think I could ever do the discus. So it was one of those sports because I remember yeah. my brother did it too. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, basketball too. We knew each other through that. Um, let, let's start off with talking a little bit about uh, where you where your athletic background comes from and uh, what what you did growing up. All right. Yeah. So I started in sports when I was like two years old. Um, I think the first sentence I ever said to my mom was, "Mommy, I want to dance." Um, so I started dancing as when I was like two and a half and I was a toddler did that for until I was about 11 or 12. Um, but during that time, I also got into playing other sports like basketball. I bowled, which is super cool. Um, I curled, which is another really cool sport. Mm -hmm. um, and then I got into volleyball and kind of like the whole dance thing, as much as I loved it, I just didn't have the time to dedicate to competing in it. Um, especially not at such a young age. So I focused more on basketball Mm -hmm. played a ton of sports all through high school. Um, and I just always loved, you know, sports. Like I just always loved competing. I'm a very competitive person. Um, and then I found a, I found boxing when I was about 15 in grade 10. Um, it was through dancing, was, wasn't it? Or were you watching a TV show? Yeah, yeah I was watching it. It was, I was watching a TV show. I was watching dancing with the stars and Layla Ali was on it. She's Muhammad Ali's daughter. And I was just like, I had no idea who she was. Like boxing was not something that was ever on in my household. My mom hated it. Um, mm. Like hate is an understatement, I think, um, wow. for how she used to feel about it. So we never watched it. And I just saw this woman on TV who, you know, she was so elegant and beautiful. And like her physique though was insane. Like it still is insane. Mm -hmm. um, and so I kind of did some research on her, found out she boxed. And I was like, man, this is who I want to be. Like, I want to be like this person. So then I waited until I was 18 because my parents didn't let me box um and then as soon as basketball season was done in my last year of high school i went down to the gym and just picked it up from there that's awesome and sarn you here you, Jim? yeah yeah so yeah. sharky's athletic club actually used to have a boxing club that was run by kathy year um she had won two canadian titles when she boxed and uh she also did this program called box on where she would go to high schools and i had seen her come into the same paths actually um but she was doing the grade above me um their fitness class and i was just like captivated by yeah. this idea of boxing um, so yeah, so I started at Sharky's, boxed there for about six months. And then by that point I had to move for school. I think it was about eight months I was there. I had, I had about four fights, which is really fast. Um, considering and, how long I had been in the gym. Wow. I moved to Ottawa. Yeah. Before you moved to Ottawa, you had four fights. Yeah. Yeah. Like I, um, looking back now, I moved through basically the, like the novice stage of boxing, which is your first 10 fights. But even just that initial phase of learning to box, I moved through so quickly. I had my first fight six months after being in the gym. Wow, that's incredible. But, and uh, boxing is a sport that's obviously not for everybody. And I think uh, a lot of people realize that uh, after they go into probably sparring. Um, what was it like your first time sparring? I got beat up. I got my ass whooped. Yeah. Um, this 13-year-old kid that I had trained with, he was like a 13-year-old boy, but he had like the body of an 18-year-old man. Yeah. Um, like he was like a horse. Anyways, he whooped me. He had never really boxed before either. We started at the same time, but he beat me up and I cried. Um, and Kathy, my coach at the time actually told me, she's like, you know, boxing, she didn't tell me to quit, but she was like, you know, boxing is not for everyone. Like, it's okay if, if you don't want to do this. Yeah. And I, I remember this so clearly. I looked at her stand in the off the front office that used to be at Sharky's. And I just looked at her and I was like, I was pretty heavy at the time too. When I was in high school, it was about 190 pounds and 200 pounds. Um, but anyways, I looked at her and I'm like, I'm going to make it for me. Like, I love this sport. I was told her, I was like, I'm going to drop down to 150 pounds, going to get through novice really fast, win my first provincials, podium at my first nationals, win a Canadian championship eventually and go to the Olympics. And pre we've done everything except for one thing so far. So <laughs> that's incredible. And I mean, I've, I, uh, I kind of 
didn't hear about your story. I think it was an article a few years ago, uh, just because after high school, everyone kind of wanders off and we do our own thing. And uh, we kind of reconnected, I think, uh, a few years ago now. And uh, I've kind of been watching your journey. Let's let's talk about uh, some big accomplishments and everything throughout the way. Uh, start about maybe with what, your first fight. What was that like? So my first fight was in Sarnia, um, which is actually pretty cool because a lot of people don't get that opportunity to fight in their hometown. Mm -hmm. um, and then we were... It was a weird, if I feel like it was just foreshadowing for my entire boxing career. Um, my boxing career, I always laugh that it's like, I have all these obstacles to overcome in it where like nothing has come easy, but I'm okay with that. So anyways, we, we scheduled this fight. This girl's supposed to have, you know, when you're a novice, you have to have within, I think it's within seven fights of each other, within five fights of each other. This girl's supposed to have three. She shows up. She has seven fights. I have zero. She's been boxing for like three years um, or like two years at the time. She has six wins and one loss. Okay, I'm like some, and she's ten years older than me too, so and bigger. <laughs> and is it the commissions that like make these these rules that you have to yeah, follow? Yeah, yeah. So and it'll be Boxing Ontario, and then they're governed governed under Boxing Canada. Okay. Um, so it's throughout the entire province you'd follow these rules. Mm -hmm. But anyway, this girl shows up, and my coach finds out. She comes over to me, and she's like, "Well, we have two options. We could take the fight, and you could get seriously hurt." Or we cannot take the fight. And I was like, well, well, I remember this conversation. I'm like, what makes you think I'm going to get hurt, number one? Like, I, I'm i pretty confident in myself. And she's like, okay. So we took it as an exhibition where no one's going to win. You wear heavier gloves. It's basically a glorified sparring session with a stranger. So you're trying to, like, beat them up, right? Mm -hmm. Like, there's always a winner. <laughs> like, whether yeah. it can't happen or not, there's always a winner. Of course. Um. Anyways, and it was actually a really competitive bout. And, uh. So we actually fought her two weeks later on her own show. And I ended up losing by like a point or two is back with the point scoring. Um, I lost by about a point or two. So I lost my first real fight, actually. Um, oh, wow. which most people quit after that mm. because they don't like that. Because when you're in boxing, it well, you know, from wrestling, right? When you lose an individual sport, especially when it's a physical one, you know, someone doesn't just score more points on you. You get beat up. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So like you, sure. you mentally feel beat up, but you physically feel beat up, which makes yeah. that much worse. But also, you can't blame it on your teammate. You can't be like, oh well, they missed that shot in the second quarter. Or like, oh well, you know, they did this. Like, you can't blame anybody. It's just you. You explain. You explain that perfectly because I remember in high school, uh, it was like my first wrestling event. It was a tournament in Windsor, and uh, I think I only had one match all day because there was only one other guy in my weight class at the time, and I ended up winning. Uh, and I had all this confidence, and then I went to LSSAA, and uh, it was an open weight class, so I had to go against guys who were older than me, and I got my butt whooped, and yeah, I think I lost confidence after that, and uh, it, I think a lot of people think that uh, boxing and combat sports are, uh, it's all about just the technique and everything, but there's really uh, a lot of other things that come into play when uh, being being a professional boxer, to be, taking it on as like your your job, right? Like yeah. it's not, it's not just the in-ring ability. It's, there's a lot of other stuff that involves with being a boxer. I think in hindsight too, like when I first started, I mean, when we're young, right, we think we're invincible. We think we can do whatever we want. Um, and I, I still have that opinion of myself. I still think I'm capable of doing anything I want to do, but in hindsight, like I was fighting these women who like shortly after my first and second fight there, that girl was 10 years older than me. The next person I fought, I was 18. She was 34. Oh, wow. Like, and I didn't appreciate at the time the life experience that goes into it. And mm. in hindsight, now, 10 years later, when I get in the ring with somebody who's 20 years old, it's like, I have so much more life experience than you that I can bring into this war. And I've been through so much more than you be just because I'm older mm. that, you know, whatever you throw at me, it's not going to mentally get to me because I've gone through worse things in my life. Um, and I didn't appreciate that when I was younger, first starting out. So like I was fighting these older ladies and couldn't understand why they hit so hard or why they were kind of besting me. Um, and then I realized it was the life experience, but also just years in the sport. Right. And like mm -hmm. years of being an athlete, Long doesn't matter if I've been an athlete my whole life when I'm 18, if you've been one your whole life, when you're 34, you got, you know, 16 years on me. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Definitely. So what was it like moving to Ottawa, uh, for school and, uh, moving to a new, obviously moving to a new gym, uh, was it was it hard to come out of your comfort zone and go walk into new doors at a new gym, new new coach? Um, so my co I was really lucky that um, Kathy, my first coach, she actually connected me with the coach in Ottawa. Um, she sent her an email beforehand because we were at a tournament in the states and during the summertime, mm. and she just told her, you know, Caitlin's had four fights. She just won this tournament. She fights at this weight class. 
And I remember walking in the gym and I was a little nervous um, because I was so new in the sport, right? It wasn't as if I had been a gym rat for five years and then had a few fights. It was, I've been boxing eight months. I don't really know anything about it. Don't e mm -hmm. I don't even know the rules. Like, mm -hmm. honestly, if I'm being truthful, I didn't even know the rules. Mm -hmm. um, I just knew you had to go in there and punch someone and win. Um, but yeah, I remember walking into this gym and, you know, it's a new city. I'm there for school as well, but I was mostly there for boxing. Um, and I walk into this gym and there's all these guys like my gym in starting of the gym's small there's not a lot of people and it's a lot of like youth that box mm -hmm. at this gym it was like grown men and i was i wasn't intimidated like that that's and that's how i've always known like i'm meant for this sport is that no matter what situation i walk into in the sport i'm not intimidated and i know like i know that i can get through it i know that i'm i'm supposed to be there um but it was definitely interesting trying to like fit into the, into the group that was in that gym and trying to fit in with the team because, you know, you have your team in training and then when you're in the ring, it's just you, but that mm -hmm. team in training is so important because those are the people who are going to push you and help you become better. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so I would say definitely going to a new gym, especially at such a young age with very little boxing experience was very nerve wracking. Um, but I mean, it was my home for six years, right? Like I boxed there for a long time and uh, that gym taught me so much about the sport. So I'm like forever grateful for that experience. That's awesome. And uh, you, you, it seems like you uh, had a lot of really cool things happen to you while you were up there. Um, what were some of the biggest achievements so far in your career, would you say? Um, um, I would say obviously winning Canadian championship. Mm -hmm. That's something that less than like 1% of people who ever start boxing can do is win a national title. Um, you know, I that's something that I had worked towards for so long. And there was a lot of obstacles along the way to get me there. Um, but really it came down like that accomplishment for me just sums up the entirety of my boxing career to that point where let's it was talk about that journey a little bit. Like uh, on the, obviously it, you said there was a journey to get there. What, how, how did it start? Um, my whole boxing career um, I've been underestimated. Like people underestimate me for a long time. And what it mm -hmm. was is that I was this, you know, this, 190 190 200 pound kid who walked into a gym in sarnia and started boxing mm -hmm. then i moved to ottawa oh i'm that kid from sarnia yeah. like i'm not from a big city i don't have a ton of experience um and, and I did i see you got two bronzes before before you won the national championship um, two silvers and a bronze two so silvers and a bronze okay so was that yeah so you were that was probably uh motivation to uh and it's amazing to see that you you, you, you overcame everything and uh one ended up winning your goal and now uh obviously like you said earlier there's just one more goal left on your list and let's talk a little bit about that what is the the end goal for you and what what, what do you want to do with um, so your career my coach and i actually talked about um during this whole COVID thing that we're going through because it gave mm -hmm. us a chance to take a step back from you know the everyday in the gym grinding towards fights and like you're always working towards winning something mm -hmm. to really look at the big picture. Cause we're always looking, we're always the big picture is there, but we're always looking at the immediate. Right. Um, but so we were chatting and I was like, it's always been a goal of mine to podium at the Olympics. Like, I don't just want to go there. If I wanted to go, when people say mm -hmm. that they want to go to the Olympics, I'm like, well, buy a ticket. Like, I think that if you go into something with the mindset of like, I want to go there, you're not going there to win. You're just going to compete. And those are two totally different things. Right. Um, so definitely to, to po <clears throat> sorry to podium at the olympics in 2024 um and then after that uh, i haven't really talked a whole lot about this but after that i am going to turn professional um and my goal there is to win a world championship and then just retire and start coaching is having amateur fights uh important towards going uh getting making the olympic team or uh is it like like you said kind of taking a step back and just focusing on yourself is that also another uh really good alternative for somebody for if they were looking to take that path um so going to the olympics people i think people underestimate just how much it takes mm. um like i'm at 10 years in my boxing career now and i'm still at least four years off right I, like i trained with mandy bujo she's been to the olympics in 2016 um and she's hoping to compete again in 2021 um but she's been boxing for 18 years right like these people invest their whole lives into it um and you have to have you know hundreds and hundreds of fights um, to get there, but I know that we have the time to get there and it's, it, you know, you have to be realistic about a goal like that. Um, but you also have to be a little bit of a dreamer, right? Like you have to have just like this hope that you're going to be able to do it, but then put the pieces into play, obviously, like we created the plan and now it's executing the plan. Right. 
for sure and uh looks like we have some uh, listeners here uh, someone just commented in uh she, he has an 11 year old daughter who's interested in boxing which uh i'm all for however she has some issues uh with the hit, getting hit part what uh what mindset did you have when it, and i think this is actually a pretty interesting uh question we can build off of because uh for those people listening right now and they may not know uh you have a, a condition uh that it, i don't know if it enables your boxing at all or anything but uh it definitely enables your everyday life and everything so let's talk a little bit about that and uh maybe you can give some advice to uh connor sure yeah so i'll actually start off just <laughs> sorry i went for a run earlier and it's like cold outside and it bothers, yeah. my, <laughs> bothers my throat for the rest of the day um anyways i'll start with the question there where he said about the getting hit part mm -hmm. I believe that if you're going to box, it's not like playing basketball. Like boxing is real. It's not playing basketball. It's not playing soccer. Um, but you need to surround yourself with coaches and training partners that you trust. Like my training partners that I work with all the time, I know for a fact that they would never take advantage of me in the ring. Um, I've been on the bad side of that where I have been taken advantage of in the ring. Where I've I was had just going to ask, is there, is there, is there obviously <laughs> a lot of gyms out there where kids get into the wrong situation and that just kind of, yeah, and I think that, you know, you have to you have to have the right coach. And I think as well that coach has to have a little bit of rain over both the athletes in the ring where it's, okay, you're better than this person or you're bigger or you're faster. So you have to – so don't hit them hard or, like, don't hurt them, right? Um, mm -hmm. You know, I my coach there in Ottawa, Jill Perry, she told me one time, she was like, don't beat up your sparring partners because you'll have no sparring partners left. Right. And that is so true where people who have – you know, taken advantage of me in the ring when I was starting out, I've sparred with them now that I'm much better and I've beaten them up, but then I don't ever go back to spar with them after I do that. It's like, yeah. I get my vengeance and I'm done. Yeah. Um, so I think just to answer the question, it would be to, you know, really scope out the gym that you want to be at, but build a personal relationship with that coach. Cause like your life is in that coach's hands. Mm -hmm. And that's what people don't realize when they think about combat sports that every time I get into the ring, I'm actually risking my life because I'm getting hit in the head. And it's one punch that that can change everything. Right. So that trust is a big aspect of it. Mm -hmm. um, and then to go more on like you were referencing that I have a condition. So I have rheumatoid arthritis. Um, it definitely does not make boxing is any easier from a physical standpoint. From a mental standpoint, though, it has made me so much stronger because in life, you're going to come up against obstacles that are going to deter you from your goal. And they're going to, you know, in it they're going to make you feel like you're not good enough or that it's just not meant to happen. Mm -hmm. But really those are just there to make you stronger. Like those obstacles help you become who you are supposed to be. If you're willing to kind of go head on with them. So that's how I look at my RA, you know, it, mm -hmm. my, my hands hurt my feet. Sometimes my feet go numb when I'm training. So I tell my coach, Hey, my feet are numb. Give me 30 seconds. <laughs> um, yeah. But I work around it and it's taken quite a few years to figure out what my body needs and how to work around it. But it's, it's made me mentally a hundred times stronger. Is it something you're born with or was it something, uh, when did you so, find out it was? Yeah. So it's actually an autoimmune disease. Um, so I'm also, I also have hypothyroid. So my thyroid doesn't function properly. It's low, which is not good if you're in a weight class sport. Okay. <laughs> on that one, I'm like my weight will go all over the place because if my thyroid is not medicated properly, but anyways, so it's an autoimmune condition as well. Um, and you're born with it. But sometimes it doesn't, it typically doesn't show up in you until later on in life. Like I think tip the average is like 50 years old or like 45 years old plus that people get diagnosed. Um, I got diagnosed in when I was 22 in 2014. Um, and yeah. it was right before a nationals, national championships actually. And I started getting like prickly heat, like my skin hurt um, if I was working out. And then my hands were so sore and they were swelling and I didn't know what was wrong with me. My feet, I couldn't walk when I woke up in the morning. I'd have to wait about 10 minutes and then hobble around. My knees hurt. Um, my spine hurt. <clears throat> so I went through all these tests, went to nationals anyways, won a silver medal. I lost in the finals on a split. Um, but then after, like two weeks later, we find out, I find out what's wrong with me. And I was definitely in denial at first. I was like, Oh, I'm invincible. Like I don't need this, you know, whatever. Wow. And then I realized that I had to work with it and not work against it because if I kept working against it, it was just going to keep breaking my body down. But if I work with it, then I can, you know, have longevity in the sport and be successful. Was there ever a time when you, or obviously when you found out about it, where you thought of maybe I can't do this anymore or I shouldn't do this anymore? Yeah, I, um, so in 2000, 
what year was that? I think it was 2017 was my last was my last nationals when I was in Ottawa. Um, and I was having a hard time making weight. My body hurt. I was mentally so drained. I was just kind of done with the sport. Like I hated it. Um, I was in a really rough place too. Like I was going through like bouts of depression and just in a tough spot. But then my body hurting on top of that, I started thinking like, why is, why me? Like, why is this happening to me? Um, and I remember I lost a fight that I, I should have beat the girl. Like I was way better than her. I should have beat her. Lost on a split. That's when I finished with a bronze medal. And my coach and at the time and I, we were sitting outside the venue and I was crying. And I just remember her being like, maybe that like we call it quits. Like maybe this is it. And I immediately agreed. And then about 20 minutes later, I was like, no, no, no. <laughs> I'm not quitting. Yeah. <clears throat> so that's actually a big reason why I moved back to Sarnia um, was just because like that relationship wasn't really working anymore. And I needed to figure out what I wanted to do with my life. Mm -hmm. um, so, but yeah, I, I did have that moment where I was like, yeah, I'm going to quit because this is too hard. And that's not to say that I'm not a strong person because of that, but it was like this huge reality check where I was like, I need to work with myself and not against myself to be able to do mm -hmm. this. Or I need sure. to get it before and I especially have having the goal, the goals you did, uh, I'm sure created that mindset for you. Um, going forward, uh, what you, you obviously mentioned, you want to go professional. Uh, let's talk a little bit about professional boxing for women. I'm in school right now, and uh, it's a big thing we talk about is women's in sport. Women in sports. Um, what's what is boxing like for uh, women? <clears throat> so boxing for women. Um, it's been there, but it's never really, it's kind of always been like this weird sideshow, basically. Are like, they you're, with, you're do, they the box, do they so. box, well, do they box on the same card as the men? Yeah, now they do. So this okay. is like, I'll give you like a pro wrestling analogy here. So mm. this is like when WWE turned their women's ch championship into a Divas championship and started relegating the Divas to like a 30 second match. And everyone was like, why are you doing this? This is BS. You know, these women are talented. Mm -hmm. Um that's kind of where boxing was for the longest time for women. And then it was right after the 2012 Olympics. Um, we started seeing <clears throat> because women were allowed in the Olympics finally in 2012 for boxing. Mm -hmm. Then we started seeing these women who were really skilled turning professional. And then they just eat up everybody that was already a pro. Yeah. Then in 2016, there was this another surge of women um, from the, from the amateurs to going into professional. Um, and that's where you have these huge stars right now. Like Katie Taylor won ring magazine so ring magazine is like the boxing thing mm -hmm. the boxing magazine she won ring magazine fighter of the year for the second year straight so that's a female wow and it's not a male and female award it's an award for whoever is the best and she won it that's twice incredible. yeah she's the, one of the only there's there's like three other people who've won it two years in a row and that's got to be inspirational for someone like you who's like obviously coming up and you you did you watch a lot about you said you didn't watch a lot of boxing growing up no, I didn't even start watching boxing until I was like 20. I do you already watch had it now? 15 fights before I started watching it. Do you um, watch it yeah. now? Yeah. Yeah, I watch it now. Um, I'm I prefer watching amateur to study, and then I'll watch pro for entertainment. Um, but I'm just very analytical when it comes to my sport, so I have a hard time watching it for entertainment. Anyways, mm -hmm. um, who's some of your favorites? Katie Taylor. She's yeah unbelievable. Like she's basically like I don't know if you know who uh, Vasil Lomachenko is, but she's essentially the female version of Lomachenko. Wow. She's so skilled. Um, she's quite good. Canelo Alvarez, um, even though he did test positive for steroids, he uh, the guy's good. Like You can't even argue how amazing he is at boxing. And then Tyson Fury is my favorite, though. And for him, it's he's so entertaining in the ring, but it's the struggles he's been through in life. Like He had mm -hmm. a cocaine addiction, was going to commit suicide, gained like 150 pounds, got stripped of his titles, yeah. comes back loses all the weight he's sober now i think that's so when good. i really got back into into boxing i obviously obviously i watched the mcgregor and mayweather thing but that doesn't I, for me that doesn't really count it was just like a like you said a sideshow but uh i got really into it when i watched that tyson and fury card and the, what, what do you feel about the state of bite boxing overall right now like we just had mike tyson and roy jones fight like i know you're a big uh, roy jones fan you had the opportunity there to meet him uh was that in ottawa yeah, that was in Ottawa, actually. That's my yeah. old coach there, Jill. Um, oh, that's awesome. Yeah, I got to meet him. Uh, we actually hung out at his, at his hotel, which was, like, super cool. That's awesome. Um, <laughs> yeah, he was a really nice guy. Mm. I think for boxing right now, we're having this, like, it's like people are rediscovering our sport. And while mm. I hate the friggin' YouTube boxers, it's not boxing. Like, they suck. 
Yeah. Like that. I don't know who is that? Like Logan Paul is that who just fought? Yeah, Logan and Jake Paul. I think they're both they trying. Both to... They both yeah. suck. Like, yeah. I could train someone for six months and they would be they would kill them. Yeah. Um <laughs> but anyways, I think that that's good though. It gets people into our sport. And like if that's what our sport like if that's what brings people to watch, then they can eventually discover what real boxing is and fall in love with the sport for what it actually is. Yeah, I was just talking to a friend about it last night. Like we were trying to figure out like what was the biggest pay-per-view by uh like we've seen the Tyson or yeah, the Tyson and Jones Jones numbers and I was trying to look back and find stuff. It just seems like it hasn't been like a really recepted sport in the last few years, which I don't really get because even like the the undercards, uh, like the undercard fights, I don't know if you got a chance to watch them on the Jones and Tyson card, but I think it was the first fight of the night that was on YouTube. It was probably one of the best boxing matches I've ever seen. Like, and I enjoy like I enjoy watching like amateur. Uh, when I worked at the station, there was boxing fights and MMA fights. And are you an MMA fan at all? Yeah. So if I was saying that I watch boxing and then I like try to watch it for entertainment in terms of the analytics. Um, I watch MMA just because I like watching people beat each other up. <laughs> has has that ever been something you've uh, thought about crossing over to? Or? Never. No. I never want to get kicked in the face. Yeah, I know. I, like, I, I could go the rest of my life without eating a knee in my like forehead. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. I know I um, threw the offer out there for uh, the Cam Valley Wrestling in- Invitational Battle Royal a few years ago. So, I mean, if the, if wrestling ever happens again, that offer is always out there. If uh, you ever want to cross over into the ring and uh, I, I think I, my I, dream in life actually I kid you not my goal in life after I'm done all the whole boxing thing I want to perform in either AEW or WWE like mm-hmm. that's right I am obsessed with professional wrestling that's awesome are you watching right now then with the pandemic and everything <laughs> Yeah, I'm watching a little bit. Um, yeah, I find it a little hard to watch without the fans and whatnot for weird. the guys to build off. And uh, even but even boxing and MMA, it's kind of – I find it more in- interesting with the UFC because you can hear, like, all the coaches and everything. That's yeah. really that's really neat. But, uh, yeah, I'm uh, I've, uh, it's been hard for me to watch. And not being able to do events as well, that, that kind of puts a damper on things for me. Yeah, it's been challenging to watch and also just because, like – you know, they let, like, WWE especially. Like, I watch AEW, um, yeah. but WWE, will, like, that's always going to be the flagship of yeah. pro wrestling. Um, it, they had to let go of so much talent because they couldn't yeah. afford them. And then you're always seeing the same, like, 15 guys on your screen. Um, but they let go of a lot of really good talent. Mm-hmm. And so it's kind of been a little bit hard to watch. Um, I'm more into watching the women anyways. And they're just, yeah. like... And they, what they've been doing in the last year... Plus, with them is absolutely incredible. Like the the pay per view. Oh, yeah. um, I wish they would have done it back in the day when uh, there were a lot of really good women wrestlers around. They just used them, like you said earlier, they used them wrong and they named it I, a different division. And yeah, I think, and I, think um, I think something that WWE did correctly now is that they're recruiting actual athletes. Mm-hmm. Um, like this, I love Trish Stratus. I love Lita. Like Lita was like my idol when I was a kid. Yeah. Um, I met Trish Stratus, like I pay homage to her when I meet her, but like they did a lot of great things for WB and wrestling in general, but now like they don't even hold a candle to like the athletes that the WB has now for the yeah. women, like Charlotte Flair, that girl's oh, a specimen. Like, yeah. <laughs> and even like Sasha Banks, like these, they're, they, and who, um, what's her name? I can't think of her name. Um, the EST, what, she's like the best, whatever that girl, she was like, a national level track star yeah is that bianca belair i'm thinking yeah, bianca yeah, belair, yeah, yeah 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 i just remember her like slogan like the, the honestly like belair. i i haven't watched too much of that at all but yeah all those girls and like uh, there's a ton of, on the indie scene that are really like amazing athletes and it's great to see that they're all uh, getting the spotlight yeah no i love it I actually a friend of mine she does some like amateur pro wrestling shows in toronto um and it's just kind of cool to like see other athletes get into especially females right because mm-hmm. It's, it was never weird for, like, men to go into pro wrestling, cross over from another sport. Like, football players did it all the time. Um, but with women, it was more of you had to be, like, some hot model to get in on it, I guess. Yeah. And now it's, like, you see these women who on your screen who are, you know, they're really fit. And, like, yeah, they're pretty, but they're not there because they're pretty. They're there because they're athletes. Right. And they made it, yeah, for sure. Well, we talked to uh, – speaking on the pandemic side of things, how wh- how is the pandemic uh... – like, how has it affected you at all through your training through the year? Like, uh, is it has it been hard for you to keep a level head and 
uh, keep moving forward or have you kind of, like you said, just step back with your coach and focusing on things with him? Um, it's had its moments. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's safe to say for everyone. Who um, is your coach? My right coach now. is Sid Vanderpool, actually. He's, uh, he fought Bernard Hopkins. And no James way. Kennedy. Yeah, no, the guy fought for two world titles. Um, he was an amazing professional. Look him up. Like, he's so good. Yeah. And he's the most humble person I've ever met. How did you meet him? I was... Um, I started going to his gym maybe, like, two and a half years ago. One of his girls was like, hey, can you – we met in Hamilton for sparring, and then she's like, hey, can you just come to my gym? It was closer for me, so I drove – I didn't know who he was. And then people laugh at me now about it. Cause he's like really famous. Uh, but <laughs> I didn't know who he was. And then I just saw this guy and he was like, stand outside the ring, watching me box. And then they come back the next week. I don't bring a coach any of these times that I'm here sparring his pro. And then he gives me like one little nugget of information for sparring. And so I, I run with it. I listen to it. Then he slowly starts like talking to me more. And it took me about five months to actually know who he was. Um, and then it was about, I started working together um, February of 2019 and he was a huge influence on me winning my first Canadian title there. It was seven weeks of working with him twice a week. And I was driving two hours each way. It was craziness. Um, but he tra- like, he helped me hone a lot of skills. Like there's so many moments in the gym where we were doing something. And I looked at him and I'm like, how did I get this far without you? Like, it's not a slam on how far I've gotten. But like, he's telling me all these things that to me are very rudimentary that I didn't do correctly. And I'm like, it's insane to me that I got this far without you. And now that I have you, like, sky's the limit. Yeah. Um, so about, I think it was September. So what is that? Five months after I won my Canadian t- championship, I sat down with him and my training partner, Mandy. And I was basically like, I want to move here. Will you coach me full time? If I do, I'm going to quit my career, put everything into this. And yeah. That's awesome. And we're three days away from 2021. Uh, any plans or anything uh, for the year? Um. Uh, is there any so, events happening for amateur or anything right now? Like, is there anything you could go and do or? No, we're kind of handcuffed right now. Um, yeah. in Canada. Yeah. Um, every other country though, pretty much is competing still. Um, have you thought about going off and g- going to another country or would that just be kind of too hard or. I mean, it could boxing yeah. Canada wouldn't be happy with me. Um, yeah. <laughs> so I could, but then there's like all the consequences that go along with it. Right. Like right. I love competing for Canada. Um, so are you on, you're you're a part of Team Canada. Uh, yeah. So if they were to go to the Olympics, say next year, you'd be on the team. Uh, not for the Olympic team, no. So okay. with the women, we don't have every weight class in the Olympics yet. Equality is coming okay. shortly, hopefully. Okay. Um, we don't have every weight class, so I'm in an all Olympic weight class right now, but we're gonna move into an Olympic weight class for the next cycle. Um, so the way it works is that. Tip, like it takes about four years, four or five years of being like on the national team um, and competing internationally to make it that far. So mm-hmm. Boxing Canada, like they invest in somebody for four or five years and that's the person that they're going to send. How did you um, get into onto Team Canada? I won, I won the nationals. So we're a different sport in that there are other sports where if you lose the Canadians, you're still on the national team. With us, you lose your out. Like you have to win every year. So there's a lot of pressure that goes with it. Um, so for example, you could be on the national team for eight years because you won eight Canadian championships. You go to one and you lose by like you lose because something weird happens. Right. You're probably not on the national team anymore. Oh wow. Yeah, no, there's a lot of pressure there. Um mm-hmm. so you would you would probably have already or would be competing for a national championship again this year. If um thing, so if things would have went if, if things, things were the way they should have been with like if there wasn't something called COVID, um, mm-hmm. yeah, we would have had a Canadian championship in May. Um, and then they pushed it though till next November. So we're just under a year away now, um, which is, I actually like it because my coach and I, we have made so much progress in my technique over this time. And we've adjusted so many things, just my mindset. My mindset is so different now than mm-hmm. it was a year ago. Um, so I'm actually really happy of all this time to develop like this. Cause this is a gift. If you if you think of this as a gift, it's going to be a gift. If you think of it as a burden, it's going to be a burden, right? Life is all about perspective. Um. So yeah. So I mean, the pandemic's been hard, but the- this is the fourth episode, and you're the fourth person who's come on here and said that exact same thing. That uh, you just kind of got to make the best of it. Uh, and if you're going to make it a burden on your life, then it's going to be a burden. But uh, 
you made the best of it and it's great to see like uh seeing you post videos outside training uh bare feet in the middle of winter in canada uh it's really inspirational and i want to say that i'm really looking forward to see where you come in the next few years i don't want to take too much more of your time but for the people still uh, listening and watching in right now uh where can they find you at um so you can find me on instagram i use that the most i don't really post on facebook that often mm -hmm. um so my instagram handle is at katie clark.92 um so that's the best way or you can just search me on facebook and it's caitlin clark for sure and i see like uh a lot of amateur boxers, they have to do a lot of fundraising and whatnot, uh, obviously to compete and, uh, just kind of sustain what, uh, do you, is there anything that you're doing, uh, through the COVID or anything to, uh, raise anything or how, how is, how are boxers like surviving right now? Um, so I run a, like, I quit my actual career so I could do this full time mm -hmm. and then we have a pandemic. So I'm actually a tutor as well. So that's I mean, right. I, I'm glad you brought yeah. that up because honestly, there's a few times uh, near the end of this. I don't know if you do. I, I noticed you mentioned it's uh, more for younger kids, but uh, there's a few few times there near the end of the semester where I felt like I probably could have reached out to somebody. And uh, But uh, let's talk a little bit about that. You are a tutor. Yeah. So, I mean, people that always throws people. They're like, what, mm. you box and you're smart? Or like by the parents of the kids I tutor, they're like, wait, <laughs> you box? Like, yeah. but you're so smart. <laughs> um I love school. Like that's the thing I love mm. learning. Um, and I have a gift for teaching. Um, so I just decided that I, and I love it so much that it's when I'm doing it, I know I love it because when I'm doing it, I'm not thinking about anything else. I'm just so in the moment when I'm working with these kids, it's the same way I'm when I'm boxing. Um, so I, basically I just tutor people now. I just tutor kids on every subject from junior kindergarten all up to university. Oh, perfect. Um, yeah. And I just, it's all by referrals. Like I'm really blessed that I've built cultivated some really great relationships with people where they're willing to you know go out on a limb for me and give a recommendation that i'm a great tutor for their friends and for their family so that's awesome that's great well that's uh i'll definitely be reaching out in the future when i uh find myself at the end of the semester crunch and uh again i really appreciate you joining me here tonight i don't want to take too much more of your time i'm sure you got a busy day training tomorrow what's your training schedule like is it pretty uh yeah pretty um actually i was joking with my teammate today like we're in fat camp because we both want to get back down to our fight weight because i mean 10 months without competing your weight's naturally good like we don't walk around on fight weight no no mm -hmm. like as a fighter it's just not something you do right on top of that um, christmas <laughs> right so in a <laughs> pandemic where yeah. like you know it's a little depressing sometimes and you know mm -hmm. it's not the same intensity as a fight camp but we're you know right now we're in fat camp where like we want to get back down to our fight weight um so training is definitely upped so I'm training my boxing in the morning and then I tack my strength and conditioning onto that. So instead of doing them as two separate, so it's like a three hour chunk, two and a half to three hour chunk of training in the morning. Um, and then I rest for about five hours and then I go for a run. So and how's the training working? Like, are you, obviously Ontario's in lockdown right now. I don't know if, can you, since you're on team Canada, I know for like other sports, if you're either a professional fighter or, part of a team can you still go into the gym workout or yes yeah, so there's some rules around that so i actually have um during the first round of lockdown yeah. i uh set up a heavy bag in my dining room i'm actually staring at it right now so awesome. i have enough stuff at home where i can train at home and my coach is great you know he does things over video with me um, do you, and do you uh, recommend that for like because we we had somebody actually asking in here about uh, a gym in sarnia uh is is online training becoming a thing yeah, so my coach actually does it. Um, Sid, Sid Vanderpool, if you just look him up, he does a ton of online training with people. He's great. I've worked like having worked with him over video for the entire first round of you know this lockdown thing. Um, mm -hmm. It was amazing. I learned so much, and you know to think that I like it was in my house while I was doing it, and he's just in his own house. It was yeah. pretty interesting. Um, I don't believe it's a huge like you can't completely substitute it for the real thing, but I think that it helps. Yeah. For sure. So yeah, like when it's the only option, you know, you got to do what you got to do. That's right. So yeah, I'm like busting my ass in my house every, in my apartment every day. Just keep training. <laughs> that's awesome. Well, that's great to hear. I'm really looking forward to it. Like I said, if you get any merchandise or anything, um, or if you do any fundraising or anything, just feel free to hit me up and uh, I'll always support. I'm looking forward to uh, seeing you make it to the Olympics in 2024. It's going to happen. I know it is. Um, and I just want to let you know, you've really done our city proud and it's great to see uh, another St. Pat's fighting Irish uh, out there doing great things.
Awesome. Thank you so much, Aaron. I've yeah. loved, you know, I've loved doing this with you. So if you ever yeah. need a guest again, you can hit me up. For sure. Absolutely. And like I said, uh, once we get back to the wrestling, uh, we'll definitely be hitting you up for, uh, we can, we can get you to take out Brian White for, uh, he, he's the last person who won the, the battle Royal, the, the counselor. So we can get you to go in there and take him out and take him out. That's yeah. cool. I, I used to work for the County. So that's awesome. Perfect. There we go. <laughs> I actually know him. So. There we go. Shout out to Brian White. <laughs> All right. Thanks so much. I appreciate it once again. Uh, we'll do this again sometime. And uh, like I said, feel free to reach out if you ever need anything. Awesome. Thanks, Aaron. Yeah, thank you. All right. So that was uh, Caitlin Clark joining me here for uh, episode number four of the Chem Valley Show. Thank you so much again for tuning in. Uh, we'll, we'll be back again tomorrow for uh, lockdown day number five. So thank you very much.